Hi everyone, my name is Courtney. I write under the pen names Lyra Parrish and I'm one half of the USA Today best-selling duo Kennedy Fox. And today is Monday, the first Monday of 2022, coming in hot. And that means it is Q&A Monday. If you have any questions, there is a link where you can submit them down below in the description box. So keep them coming. As long as I've got questions, I will keep the series going. And if we run out, then that will just be the end of it. The first question comes from Alexandra. Says, can you recommend a good place to find an editor that doesn't involve getting recommendations through Facebook? Thank you. You know what I'm gonna say, that all authors should be on Facebook. I understand that it's not the platform for some people, but the groups are very helpful and I will forever recommend the Inkers group that is by Alessandra Torre. It's an amazing group. I've been talking about it for years on my channel. I will put the link down below in the description, but there are people in that group who have just started writing and there have been people who have been writing for over a decade. So I find it very helpful and people are pretty honest with their recommendations. If you don't want to use Facebook, there is a forum that used to be called Kindle Boards. I think it might be called K Boards now. I will put the link right here if it is still active and you can also find editors on Goodreads and also if there is someone who is self-published who writes in your genre and you've read their books and you feel like their books are well edited typically self-published authors will put who their editor is on the copyright page you can just download a preview of books and see if the person has continuously used the same editor throughout or if they switched editors or whatever the case is I know that in the front of our books we do that we even have a link to our editors website if any one is curious. I will say that when you're hiring an editor, regardless if they are recommended to you or not, you should be testing them. They should edit one sample chapter for you. And I have been called a Slytherin for suggesting this several times. Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. There's no doubt about that. But you should put known errors in your document when you are testing editors. And the reason why I say that is because as authors, we may not know all of the grammatical rules if things are correct or not, but if you purposely misspell a word and you keep your key and then you send that to that editor with your known mistakes in there and they miss those, that person is not worth hiring. Especially very basic things like word misspellings. If you put a apostrophe in the wrong place in a contraction. I mean, very, very basic things. If the things that you purposely put into your doc that you know are wrong or missed in the first chapter, move on to someone else. I will say that our editor, we have used her for years. I used her before I was writing under Kennedy Fox. I've used Jenny as a regular editor. I've used her as a proofer. I have just used her in different ways since pretty much the beginning of when I started publishing and I enjoy working with her. She understands that we write deadline to deadline and she has the same type of schedule as us and I appreciate what she's done for us so we can make sure that we can upload an edited version for publishing on time. Once you find a good editor, you will more than likely stay with them for a long time. I would say that Grammarly is great for you to do a first pass, but I would never publish a book that should just push through Grammarly and then published. I think that you need a real person and real eyes on that and that these programs, Pro Writing Aid, Grammarly, they're great for you to learn different things that you're doing wrong, but they're not always correct. You need a real person to edit your book. And that's just something that I have always spent money on. It's something that I truly believe every self-published author needs because as a group, it's our responsibility to publish good work or the stigma of self-published authors publish crap will perpetuate on for forever. And I would like for us to end that stigma because I consider this my career and I take it pretty seriously and it hurts when people say, oh, well, romance authors aren't real writers. I've heard that one. And it hurts when people are like, oh, well, self-published authors, they just write and publish shit work. Like that's not true. There are a lot of self-published authors who are at the top of their game, who compete with trad pub back to back, who make lists beside traditional published authors, and who also reap the rewards of all the hard work because it's not easy. I will step off of my soapbox that apparently I am standing on and go to the next question. The next question comes from Paula and she says, hi Courtney, I have a Windows laptop and I know that you format your books with vellum. Can you recommend a software for Windows to use for formatting? Love, Paula. Hey Paula. So you can use vellum 
with a Windows machine. You can go to Mac in cloud.com you can buy the upgrade in vellum where you can do unlimited paperbacks and ebooks and then you can go to mac and cloud they have the application that's installed on there it's a web-based thing you can log in and use vellum that way i have a friend who is a hardcore windows user her husband is very techy and they do not do Apple products in their house, not even their cell phones. And Vellum is one of the easiest programs to use. So I would recommend you try Mac and Cloud. I think you can buy like an hour of Mac and Cloud and try it out and see how that works for you. There's also Articus. I will say that I have not tried Articus. I do not cheat on my Vellum application because it's very easy to use and it's very user friendly. But Articus was recently released. I've read in forums that people have had issues with it. It's not as great. It's kind of complicated. I don't have any sort of experience using it and you might like it. I don't know what the cost is. I know that Vellum is $249 for the completely unlimited unlocked version. I downloaded Vellum back in 2015 or 16, right when it was launched, and they have just really put the time into update it. Now you can make beautiful paperbacks with like pictures on the front page of every chapter. Um, I don't have a copy of our books that's formatted like that yet. Vellum, I just, I can't recommend it enough. I've got a link down below. It is a affiliate link, I believe. I don't know what I get if you guys purchase it from there, but the link is down below if you would like to use it. I should probably make a list of all these links I need to get together. Hold on. It's because you know, I do the work for you guys. I will hook you up. Bing. I wish I could wink the correct way. Next question comes from Zara, and I feel like this is one of those setup questions, but anyway, it says, if you were to start over as an author, would you publish in KU or wide? <sighs> I'm just gonna continue the question. I used to publish on KU with a pen name publishing steamy stuff, but looking to start over with a new pen name writing YA. Looking to get ultra serious with my publishing business, but unsure if wide would be the best option to make the most money. Or would you gather an audience from KU then switch to wide? Thanks. This is a hypothetical situation. If I was starting over with the knowledge that I already have, because you've already done the KU thing, you know how it works. So you have experience writing a book and publishing it. With that being said, I would go wide. And the reason for that is because I believe that KU is a very specific type of audience. I personally believe that YA books would do better on a wide platform because there is more reach. It could be hard at first starting out to get seen on Amazon, but once you have like three or four books, I would absolutely apply for a book bub and make sure that your back matter is updated to lead people to the next book. And when you do a book bub, I wouldn't do a 99 cent one unless that's all they will give you free all the way. And people get really nervous when I'm like, just give a book away, like literally just give a book away. When you do that, there is no risk for people to try your work. And we have made tons of super fans with people just getting one free book. They read through our entire backlist guys. And that's like 30 something plus books at this point. So if one person falls in love with us, it's a very big deal financially and just for our brand because they typically follow us to whatever it is that we write next. So freebies, absolutely, once you have several books for them to read through. I've seen new authors where they've got two books and they do a book bub on the first one and then all they have is one more book for people to read through. It's more beneficial if you have several things for people to move to next, especially if it is a series. For example, our duets, they are typically six book series. We like the six book mark because the read through is great on that number for us. And we do have stuff that is longer now, the Circle B Ranch series, which will be 10 books, but the first one is a frequel novella. So it's really a nine book full length series. We like to wait until there are a lot of books for people to read. So with the six book series, between book five and six, we like to apply for our book bub for book one then. So then people can read book one, two, three, four, and five, and then pre-order number six, which gives us a greater possibility of potentially making a bestseller list. I would go wide. I personally would go wide and maybe that's my bias, but I just think that there's a bigger audience on all platforms. And when you do that, you can also get your books translated into different languages and that is just a whole other way for you to make more money which guys coming up soon I will have a video on how to make more money with your self-published book so stay tuned to that 
might be next week. So spoiler alert. Also, I feel like if you start in KU, it's hard to gain an audience on all platforms because KU readers don't typically follow people once they take their books out of Kindle Unlimited. I think that our readers who already had Kindle Unlimited were happy because they could now read our books without paying for them, but they were readers who were paying for them before reading them with their subscription. So when we left Kindle Unlimited, there were a handful of people who were upset because they would only read us if we were in KU. And so it's a different audience that you have to cultivate. I think that when you teach people to pay at the beginning, it's not even an issue. When you build your audience on them reading it for free with their subscription and then you start asking them to pay for your work, that's when they drop you because they have a subscription and they can binge through a hundred million thousand other books. I feel like a lot of those people who are hardcore KU readers don't flip over to the paid side. That's another reason why I would start wide. So then when you're building your platform for your new pen name at the beginning, you're building it across all platforms and not focusing on those people who just want to read it for free. I think as a new new author who has zero experience at all, starting in KU is a good place. You learn how to upload, you learn how to meet deadlines, you learn how to deal with bad reviews, you learn the basics of self-publishing and you go to the other platforms with the knowledge that you already know how to do the very, very basic things. So it's a great place to start as newbies. There are authors who have published way more books than me, who make way more money than I do, who are hardcore KU, who will stay in KU for the rest of their life or the rest of the time that KU is available for authors. And they would completely probably disagree with me, but I've seen the other side and I know that KU is a toxic environment for my mental health, for Brooke's mental health, and for a lot of other people's mental health. So if if you can avoid KU, I would avoid it. But as a newbie, I understand joining it and learning the ropes and I would almost recommend it. But then again, like you leave so much on the table when you give Amazon your book babies. I bet you the people who have 60 books who are in KU, who write long full length books, who have a built in Kindle Unlimited audience, if they were to go wide, since they are so large, I think that they would do perfectly fine and probably make way more money because they have such a huge backlist that it's nothing to do different loss leaders and different freebies to quickly build the foundation of that audience on all the other platforms. But I will get off the KU and wide train. If you want more of this discussion, I have two videos of the pros and cons of going from Kindle Unlimited. I have several videos about it, how Kindle Unlimited nearly killed our career. It's something that I'm very serious about. At RAM, I talked about how KU literally almost killed our career. I will post links to those videos down below as well. The next question comes from Jules and she asks, which newsletter book sites would you recommend a debut author apply to other than BookBub? That's a great question. So we write romance. So we do a lot of romance specific newsletters like Robin Reads, um, Red Feather Romance, Fussy Librarian, I think is all genres. It's not as great as it used to be, but it's pretty easy to get in. It's a low cost ad. There are a few others. I also have a Google Doc spreadsheet that... I don't know where I got it. I think it was like one of the conferences that I attended. It's a spreadsheet where it's this company that you fill out one document and you check all the book sites that you want them to apply to for you. I also have a list of different promotional websites that someone else compiled and I think it has like 20 or 50. There's a lot of links on it and I will post the links to both of those spreadsheets down below. We use very romance specific advertising places when we can't get book bubs because we want to make sure that we're honing in on a group of people who are our audience instead of, you know, this master wide list, especially if we're spending money and it's not going to be on BookBub. But there are other places that just do young adult books or do clean romance only or do different things like that. There are people who will newsletter stacks. So if you can't get a book bub, spending the money that you would spend on BookBub, which is normally like, what, $300, $350, $400, depending on what the list is that you're trying to go for. Even more than that, if it's a contemporary book, I think that list is like in the $700 range. So 
when you newsletter stack, you can get the same types of results that you would get with just doing a bookbub. But even when we do bookbub, we will go ahead and newsletter stack and try to reach a lot more people than what even bookbub has. And that's just a part of our process when we have a freebie. Man, the links that are gonna be in the description for this video gonna be a little bit crazy. The next question comes from Sasha and she asks, how do you give a character their own voice? How do you separate characters from each other? Do you make a whole character profile for that? So what we do is we absolutely have character profiles for all of our characters and it's something that Brooke and I have at the top of all of our plot documents because it's really easy to forget certain things and of course, we have to make sure that we're on the same page. To make your characters different, I feel like they need to have different struggles and different types of backgrounds. We write romance, so you've got your hero and your heroine. If our leading lady has a sister, she's typically opposite from her sister. She has different quirks and different personality traits and likes different things. And we also make sure that they have some sort of internal conflict that they have to work through in our books. And so that gives your characters more depth where they're not just one dimensional and have this perfect life and just have everything handed to them because that's not reality. With our character profiles, we've got their name, we've got their age, we've got their birthday, we have things about their family, we have their brothers or sisters names and ages. We also have the date that the book starts in case we write in a series and we have to figure out how old they are. We also put any backstory up there like medically discharged from the military and kind of what happened and we will make sure that we've got all of the details worked out on their past, on their present, and then of course the epilogue talks about the future. Our readers love our characters because they start at a really kind of hard place in their life and then you get to see them with their happily ever after at the end of the book. And maybe not all their issues are taken care of. Maybe, you know, if they've got a horrible past with their family, maybe they meet this woman who has an amazing family who takes them in and so that hole is filled. We don't make it easy where like, if they have a bad relationship with their family that they're like, oh, well, we're just gonna make up and they're just gonna hug toxic people and let them back in their life. Like, that's not real life either. Showing the characters past, present, and future. Like, what happened in their past? How are they dealing with it in the present? Are they going to therapy? Are they completely ignoring it? Do they not trust people over it? How has that thing affected them in today's life? And what's going to help them heal, to recover, to fix that, to fill that void? What's going to bring them to that point in their character arc? And that's essentially how we do it. But character profiles, like, I would be Lost without it, I wouldn't know what color their eyes are, what type of vehicle they drive, what their past is like. I would forget their family members' names. I use it a whole lot and it's actually a part of my Scrivener. I've got my plot that I use and I've also got my character profiles so I can easily find things about the people that were writing at that point in time. So hopefully that was helpful. I think this is going to be the last question. It looks kind of long, so we're just gonna go through this together. This one comes from Victoria. She says, hey Courtney, I really love your channel and I appreciate your immense knowledge about the self-publishing world. Oh, thank you so much. It really, like, that means a lot to me for real. I hope you know how much you are helping new self-published authors like myself. Oh, like that's the whole goal. I recently published my first debut novel in early November and today I've sold 48 copies aside from Kindle K -E -N -P. That's the way that Amazon tells you how many pages your book is and what you're going to get paid for. It's the KNP. -E I was recently at a conference and uh, one of the authors called it the Knippy, which was really cute. Uh, but anyway, I've seen a slowdown in sales and reads, possibly because of Christmas. Absolutely. If you watch my last Q&A video, I will put a card up above. It is the holidays and it's very competitive right now and it's going to continue to stay competitive until after the new year and even then, you know, traditionally published books are being pushed out for their winter quarter. So there's going to be a lot of competition in January and probably early February as well. That's normal. Our sales dipped during the holidays too. I, I think that that's something that happens pretty much every year unless you have a huge sell and even then the competition is still very high. The question continues, what is your advice for someone like me who is constantly refreshing the reports page? LOL. 
Oh man, that is addicting, isn't it? Like I remember being a new author and like refreshing it every hour. And then I realized that I had a toxic relationship with my sales page and I should probably just check it once a day. But then again, I also have kind of like some obsessive personality traits. So uh, that could probably be part of my ADHD. The things I've learned about myself in the last three months. We're going to continue on with this question. I know when I saw the slowdown in empty KU reads on the graph, I became discouraged. I also saw the changes in my royalties where the amount went down a few dollars, even though no one requested refunds. Aside from that, I'm racking my brain on what to do next and whether there's something I've missed. I've revised my blurb a few times and keep testing things to see if I should be doing something different. Thank you so much for everything. I am preparing for the release of my second book and I'm going to make sure I focus on building up everything prior to release thanks to your channel you have no idea how much you've helped me and I'm so thankful that your channel exists all Victoria like I feel like my eyes kind of watering a little bit <sighs> why am I so emotional right now anyway um I'm sure the haters will enjoy that one I am not going to I'm not gonna do it I'm not gonna cry if you've already changed your blurb my question is, could it be your cover? I know I talked about this in my last Q&A too, but the thumbnail test is so freaking important, guys. It is like the most important thing that you could do when you are a new author. Back in the day when I started publishing, covers were not as great as they are now. We got away with some crap. And I'm not, I'm not kidding, like the covers that we had in 2013 and 2014 are equivalent to what I looked like as a teenager in the 90s, like a tween compared to the tweens today. Like there's just no competition. The tweens today can contour and 13 year old me could barely brush her teeth, you know? So like, it's a huge difference. And because self-published authors have really just stepped up their game, it makes it a lot harder to be competitive if you don't know the things that you need to have in your cover for your genre. That being said, I kind of want to do a thumbnail test for those people who think that they may have a cover problem. What I would like you guys to do, if you would like me to do a thumbnail test on a video live for all of my subscribers and anybody else to see, if you're okay with it, then email me your cover and in the title put thumbnail test. That's gonna go to lyraparish at gmail.com. Email me your cover and I will do a video showing you guys how to do the thumbnail test and whether I believe these covers can compete in the genre, in the market, and we'll go through several of them. So if you guys send me your covers, absolutely, we'll go through it together. I've hesitated doing this several times, but people have been like, I would be happy for you to review my cover and look at it, but just know that it's gonna be on a video that will probably last forever. I will not be rude, but you guys know how I am. I'm pretty blunt. Like, I will tell you why this cover is not working, why this cover won't compete. And so if you don't wanna hear that possibly your cover sucks, do not email me. Don't do it because I don't wanna hurt anyone's feelings. And if you know that's like a, a trigger for you that I'm not a yes man, then don't email me. If you want to be involved in this thumbnail cover test video, Email me your cover. If I get five, we'll do five. If I get 50, then we'll just make it a little series. But the number one thing that I see is a cover issue. It's hard because new authors can be so married to their covers, if that makes sense. Like just straight up married to them. Like I am not changing my cover. I love it. Well, the thing is, is it doesn't matter if you love it. You could freaking get it tattooed on your arm and love it that much, but it may not sell books. Readers may be turned off. You just may have completely missed the mark. A lot of the times the text is crap. It's total crap. It's hard to read in a thumbnail. Your name is too small or your name is too large. Like there's just a bunch of different factors that go into covers. The colors could be off. I mean, there's a number of things that goes into it. Also, you have to realize that you're new. It's hard for new authors to start because 
it's so competitive and a lot of people are at a super high level. So you're trying to learn, which means that there will be mistakes that are made. And until you work through your mistakes and you learn those hard lessons, it's not gonna be easy. And still today, like as Kennedy Fox, we make mistakes. We've changed covers because we know that the ones that we had made in 2016, they just needed an update because the market is constantly changing and you have to be willing to adapt with that. And that means not being married to your covers. I understand it's art. I understand people get, but what if, what if my readers get mad at me? It doesn't matter. There's nothing that you can do about that because you're trying to find new readers. Books are your business and you can't worry about other people's feelings when it comes to you doing the best thing for your business. What categories are your books in? Are they in the proper categories on Amazon? Did you know that you can email Amazon and get more categories added to your book? Did y'all know that? Has anyone on YouTube told you all that yet? Because the three that you can choose in Amazon, that's not the limit. I think the limit is 10. So if there are other categories that your book fits into, absolutely email them and tell them that you want your book to be added in these categories as well. And you may rank higher in those subcategories because there's less competition there. I will tell you that when you're in Kindle Unlimited, you have to be pretty consistent with releasing. Like those people who release novellas, they're releasing every single month. I don't know how they do it. They're like superheroes or something, but they will release twice a month or three times a month in KU because they're writing novellas and they can pump them out really quickly. In the KU market, you have to release quite often. It's another reason why I'm so glad that we left. Wide works for us because we can release every other month and be completely fine or every three months if we wanted to bring our schedule down to that low, which would never happen because we like to publish more books and build our backlist, but releasing quickly in the KU algorithm is what Amazon likes. They want it to be stuffed full with Kindle Unlimited books. And the more you release, the more you stay in the algorithm. How long is your book? Because KU books that are longer tend to make you more money. In the breakdown that I did for the pros and cons of being in Kindle Unlimited, I did the math for it. And I would highly recommend you watch that. But I will say that your cover could be perfect, your blurb could be perfect, but you're a new author and you only have one book out. And in the beginning, it's very hard. Once you have a backlist, you'll start to see people want to binge whatever it is that you have. You will make super fans, regardless of your covers are crap or if your blurbs suck. Like there are people out there who have crappy covers and they've got a lot of readers. They've got people who will read everything because they don't care about the cover. And I think that there is an audience out there for everyone. Even if your books are crap, people will read it. I, I promise you, especially if it's in KU, they do it all the time. The goal is to release a great book. So then you make money and it is consistent. And as a new author, nothing is going to sell your last book better than your new one. Make sure that your back matter is leading people to the next book. There's just a bunch of different things that goes into it. It's hard for me to be super specific when it comes to that, especially if you only have one book released. They tend to build upon each other. And so I wouldn't focus on the royalties so much. Right now, I would just focus on releasing more books and building that backlist and having a lot of things for people to read through, especially if you're gonna stay in KU and Kindle Unlimited is your game. You just need a large backlist. You need to keep releasing. You need to keep building upon it. Make sure that you've got your newsletter where you can remind people that, you know, you released a book or, hey, I'm doing a sell. It might be worth putting that book for free and doing like a newsletter blast with it. There are some that will take Kindle Unlimited books happily and typically the readers are Kindle Unlimited limited readers. So the great thing about that is even if your book is zero dollars, you can reach people who are not in Kindle Unlimited, but then you still get those page reads when your book is marked down to free. That's one of the pros of being in KU. I would also look at your reviews and see if your reviews say anything about the plot or the pacing or the editing or anything that's like major like that. If you're getting this bunch of the same type of reviews that are talking about a specific thing that's going on, then you might have an issue with the pacing of your book or it might need to be re-edited or there are just a number of different things that could be going on. But I hope that was helpful. That's all I have for today, guys. I hope you have a happy new year. I hope 2022 
two is our year. I just know deep down in my heart that it is like I just have this electrical excitement inside of me about this year. Big things are going to happen for all of us and I'm so happy that y'all are here with me that we're going to experience 2022 together. We're just going to own it. We're just going to make it ours. I hope that y'all have an amazing incredible week. You accomplish all your goals and you write all the words and I'll see you again in my next video. Bye guys.